if we're going to have food that's grown in this country, we need to pollinate the vegetables. And without the bees, there's not an easy way to do it. They're a partner to people. They're an animal that we manage intensively uh, in order to produce our food. I've definitely never driven one of these. Beekeepers will move their colonies to do pollination services all over the U.S. There's hundreds of colonies that are on a semi-truck, uh, traveling great distances. Due to things like droughts or things like climate change, they're going to be needing to change where they actually bring their bees. Have a nice ride, bees. Good pollinating to you. <laughs> When we think about bees, we often think about honey or stings, but we should be really thinking about food and flowers. More than a hundred million years ago, flowers and bees came on this earth and developed this great relationship that's responsible for almost everything that we eat. Bees and flowers co-evolved and they have this really important relationship where flowers depend on bees to pollinate them and in turn bees depend on flowers for food. And from that simple, harmonious relationship, one of the world's oldest and most pure sweeteners is made. Despite them making a ton of honey and us looking as that being a really great resource, um, the most important reason why we depend on bees is for their pollination services. So honeybees and other managed bees, like bumblebees, um, will actually pollinate around 70% of the world's crops. 70%. 70% of the world's crops depend on bees. That means without bees, all of this food wouldn't be here. Bees are crucial. My first wife got me a couple hives for a present and uh, it started there. And, and then it grew and grew and grew yeah. and now you're at the point of, shouldn't... 8,000 hives. You say 8,000 yeah. hives, okay. Because you obviously can't count your Well, bee. the bee population <laughs> fluctuates. Right. You know, it's like the stock market. That is Chuck Cudick. He's been keeping bees and making honey since the 1970s. Do you so, say, is it called renting your bees? Is it that easy? Is it? Yeah, it's yeah. a rental, pollination rental, yeah. Pollination rental. Yeah. Believe it or not, the bees that pollinate most of your food are farmed by humans. So you can see here, that's all pollen in there. I just want to point out he's doing this without gloves on. <laughs> One hive of bees can travel thousands of miles, pollinating everything from oranges in Florida to alfalfa in South Dakota. They are brought around this country on flatbed trucks, and we thought, why not follow the bees' journey? In the fall, Chuck moves his bees from his farm in New York to South Carolina. At the end of January, Chuck sends most of his bees to California for almond pollination. There is no crop that depends on commercial bees more than almonds. At least two-thirds of the nation's migratory bees make their way to California to pollinate the groves. It's the largest migratory pollination in the world. With the sun just kissing the horizon, the work begins. Each pallet holds eight hives, and there are 112 pallets on each flatbed truck. A California almond farmer will pay up to $200 for one of Chuck's hives, and he's sending seven flatbed trucks to California this year. Once we get it all loaded, we meet the guy that'll be behind the wheel of the Beemobile. So Max, you've driven truck for? 31 years. And this is your first time doing bees? First time ever hauling bees. And so far I found that it's not a really a big deal like everybody claims. Okay. Do you have a mileage that it is? 2,600 miles. 2,600. And it'll take us four days to get out to California. Four days and 2,600 miles. To ensure that the bees are safe, Max and his other driver, Jack, need to keep the trucks moving. They cannot stop in the heat of the day, and they can only stop at night, so the bees stay in their hive. Good, how are you today, real sir? Real good, real good. Load of bees. Load of bees. So pull up right behind that last, that other uh, bee truck up there, okay? Just, they'll inspect the load, and then we'll be free to go. The truck can't go into California until it's inspected for harmful insects. Yeah, we look for the um, insects that aren't 
Oh, okay. Like fire ants. Yeah. We got more of those larvae back here too. The inspector found an unknown insect larva and it must be identified before they can get going. Until they get the okay from them, you're you're waiting. We're basically rejected from the state of California at this We're, time. I don't want to deliver a bunch of dead bees, but you're you're at the hands of the state of California until they tell you what you can do. At this point, the trucks have been stopped in the California sun for nearly an hour. Every second that they stay, it's bad for the bees. When they're stopped and it's warm, they fly out of the hives. Since we found a live insect, what we do, we take a picture with the digital microscope and we send it via email to Sacramento. Okay. And then an entomologist identifies it. If it's a good insect, not detrimental to California, then we let you proceed into California. Within another half hour, if they haven't released us or something, I need to make a phone call. They need to hose the bees down because it's not good for them to sit here. One just got me. Back here. We've watered the bees down. We've done everything we can do now. So we just got to go find out. It's been two hours now, and Max and the bees are getting restless. All right, it's time to get you guys out of here. Oh, we're going. Call you guys do your paperwork, get you buttoned up, and then we're getting you out of here, okay? Let's go. After the delay at the checkpoint, the bees are on their final leg of the journey to fourth generation almond farmer, Ryan Cousins. Bees are unloaded at, at, at the night or in colder temperatures merely because they stay in the box. If we were to unload that load during the daytime when the temperature exceeded 50, 45 to 50 degrees, uh, a lot of those bees would be coming out of the hive and then they would not necessarily all make it back into their same hive. As the sun rises over those almond groves the next morning, the bees get to work. Set some bees down that have been on a truck for several days. The bees like to uh, take, a, take a flight. They're going to survey the area, try to find some forage. And fortunately, the bees appear to have traveled well. Yeah, the bees are very, uh, uh, they're very active. Um, sometimes when bees have, uh, have high bacterial loads, the bees will even appear a dingy. You can see these bees are nice and shiny and clean. When the bees arrive, the trees are bare, but within weeks, the trees will erupt into a sea of white blossoms. It'll take almost two million colonies to pollinate the almond crops. That is almost 50 billion bees. California has over one million acres of producing almond trees this year. Those almond orchards will produce California's two billion pound plus almond crop. The price of pollinating almonds has skyrocketed since the mid-2000s. The rise in prices coincided with a very large increase in the producing acres of almond trees in California. 2005, pollination prices merely doubled to about $80 to $90. In uh, 2017, we're renting for $190 a hive. When the almond pollination season is over in March, half of Chuck's bees return to South Carolina and the other half go to North Carolina to pollinate blueberries. In the spring, some bees go to New York for apples and some go to Maine for blueberries. Finally, in summer, the bees return to Chuck's farm in New York for honey production. That's the honey that we uh, are extracting. You need warm temperatures to make honey. You need good moisture in the ground, and you need lots of flowers. We only produce 140 million pounds of honey in the U.S. The consumption is way more than we can produce. Despite being busy pollinating crops across the country throughout the year, it is only toward the end of summer on Chuck's farm that his bees make honey. You don't make much honey when you're pollinating. Because first off, there's too many bees in that area. If you've got 10 colonies on an acre, you're not going to make any honey because there's just not enough nectar available. They're going to lose weight. Okay. So, so usually you're happy if the bees come out of pollination and they look good. 
look good, meaning healthy and hopefully alive. In 2015 to 16, the nation's beekeepers lost 44% of their bees. Last year we, we were hit pretty hard. We were up in the mid 30s, maybe, maybe even 36, 37%. Some beekeepers are losing um, at least 30% of their colonies every single year, and others, even in New York, are losing up to 70% of their colonies. Let's say they were dairy cattle. Could you imagine losing 70% of your cows every year? The numbers are astonishing. So what is killing the bees? Well, it turns out there isn't just one answer. So the consensus in the scientific community now is that it's not any single factor that's driving losses of bees. Um, it's multiple factors. We know that, uh, that insecticides and, and pesticides are important, but we don't know their relative importance to other factors as well. Bees are in trouble, there's no question. Uh, bees face an array of threats uh, from pesticide exposure to new diseases to loss of habitat uh, and now climate change. Bees and plants are both shifting their timing and their geography. And what we're concerned about is that there are these mismatches in timing and uh, location, which means that bees won't have the food they need, that plants won't get pollinated. Climate change, pesticides, loss of habitat. But what about the migration itself? The bees are only eating one thing for a month. Uh, they may be exposed to agricultural pesticides while they're at particular farms. Um, and we think that that's part of the problem for, for beekeeping. There are other things that, that we'd like to see if they're actually affecting bee health and we think that they might be stressful, things like transporting your bees on a truck. We really need to understand how that stress is actually affecting bees and if that's having issues at the colony level. Some people say, why doesn't California have bees if they're going to do their pollination? They should have bees for that, that way we don't have to truck bees because that's not natural. And mm -hmm. you know, Well, that's fine and dandy, but when the almond bloom is done, it's a desert. There's nothing there for the bees to eat, and they don't realize that, mm -hmm. you know. So they wouldn't survive. They wouldn't survive. I certainly think that the migration is stressful to the bees, but if you are moving the bees to another area that is more advantageous, as far as forage uh, available for them, I think the bees overall do much better in a, in a migrating situation. So if so many bees are dying, why hasn't the price of our food skyrocketed? Well, check this out. As fast as the bees are dying, beekeepers are making bees. This is something that a lot of people don't necessarily understand because if you do track the number of colonies that are in New York or the U.S., they do tend to increase. So what they'll do is they'll split their colonies and in that way they can continue to replace the colonies that were lost and grow their operations so they're still able to produce honey. These are nucleus hives. Okay. So these are, we call them nukes. And what we do is we, we're going to split these in the spring. A hive that is thriving is split and then two are made from one. Chuck expects to make 6,000 new hives this season. And look in the, the bottom of those cells is a little white, like really thin yep. pencil. You yep. see that? That's, that's, an, that's an egg. And there's a nice sheet of brood there. That's what you want to see. Right here where yeah, it's all that, filled in. that's sealed. And you can tell how the year's going to be a little bit by how? Well, we can tell how it's been. So beekeepers are working overtime right now to try and keep up with all of their losses. Economically, it's much harder for a beekeeper nowadays to, you know, to perform all the labor that's involved with keeping up with these losses and also purchasing new, new bees from other places. The demand for good quality beehives is ever increasing. My biggest concerns is that the bee industry cannot keep up. So if you want to help, it might be a lot easier than you'd think. So the best thing that somebody at home, if they're watching this and they're like, I want to help, I want to do, what, what is the first thing that they can do? Buy honey. Buy honey. But make sure it's American honey. Planting uh, flowers in your garden, uh, maybe not mowing your lawn quite as much as, as you usually do, those will create habitat for bees. Just through education and even the media does a really great job at highlighting how important pollinators are, people are starting to be more aware of what they can do to help them and I think that that's going to go a long way. If we could get one thing across to everybody about bees, about honey, what do they need to know? If you want to eat something green and tastes good or fruits and vegetables, you need to have bees. 
I'm just holding it really tightly. Hold on, I'm just okay. gonna keep smushing. Smush away. Did you get it? I think so. I don't hear anything. I don't hear anything either. Right? No, it's in there, it's in it's there, it's in there, in there, it's in there, it's in there, oh, oh my god, it's twisting me. Wait, okay, get let's be more out. deliberate here. Get I know, that's out. what I'm get trying to out. do. Let's see. That's what I was doing before, oh, was I was going yeah. for the do sound. Do you get it? I hear it. Of course we all hear it. You guys, I don't care what you do to my hair. I know. Just, just get it out. It's screaming. It's yeah. screaming. I think I have it. Are you serious? Nope. Nope. So good. <laughs> You guys, how can you not see it? Because it's because you have a lot of hair. Yeah. Oh my god! Oh my god! Get it out! Hold on. Please. 